So good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, second webinar of the series, um, The Concept of Test Validation in Plant Health. So today uh, we will speak um, on how to adopt a new test um, in your laboratory. And um, so we have five speakers with you with us today. So Tania Dreo from uh, the National Institute of Biology in Slovenia, uh, Marta uh, Santos from Clear Detection. We also okay. have uh, Camilo Gianni sorry, uh, from Hyped Lab. We have uh, Mathieu Roland, which is working at ANSES. And we also have uh, Denise Haltenbach from uh, Bioreba. So um, we will uh, start the, the webinar on how to adopt a new test in your laboratory um, with uh, Tanya Dreo. And uh, Tanya, I will give you the key mouse and board so you can start. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us on Friday afternoon. As you have seen, uh, we are five speakers coming from both laboratory uh, and producers uh, who also have laboratories. So we all share some experience in developing, adopting and validating tests as well as testing itself. Um, the outline of the presentation uh, is uh, shown on the screen. Uh, so first we will look at the process of adopting a new uh, test um, by itself on, a, on an example of a real-time PCR for detection of Stuart's wilt in May seeds, so a bacterial pathogen. Then we will look at some more difficulties identified during adoption of different methods uh, from laboratory's point of view. And then we will switch to adopting or readopting a commercially available ELISA kit when it has been modified, switch from a molecular internal method to the use of a commercial kit, and finally uh, switch from a morphological approach to real-time PCR quantification and nematodes. In the end, we will finish with question and answer session, but uh, you are welcome to uh, type in the questions uh, all along uh, if you like. So we will start uh, with a quick poll just to uh, get to know each other better and see what kind of experience we share. So we would like to know whether your laboratory performs tests under accreditation, uh, ISO 17025, and have you adopted a new test in the past two years? You have several uh, possible answers, either that you do not test under accreditation and have not adopted the test, either that you uh, do not test under accreditation but have adopted a test or you test under accreditation have not adopted a test and finally you uh, test under accreditation and have adopted a test so please vote by clicking submitting So I will close the webinar because there are no more votes. Thank you, uh, Charlotte. So we can see that it's uh, most of us uh, and most of participants uh, do test under accreditation and have adopted a test but also uh, participants who do not test under accreditation have adopted the test. And altogether, I think this is 40, 50, 60, 
close to 70% of participants. So uh, we already know that uh, you have a lot of experience and hopefully you can share that experience with us in the question and answer session. Uh, can we please go to the, back to the webinar, Charlotte? Thank you. So we will switch now to the process, to looking at the process itself and adopting a real-time PCR for detection of a bacterial uh, pathogen. Okay, uh, this is the disease that uh, is uh, native to the Americas where it has uh, a vector and the major risk for the EU is uh, its introduction via contaminated maize seeds. So in this case, most laboratories test uh, maize seeds and are interested in low concentrations in seeds, so detecting uh, low concentrations of the pathogen and as well differentiating the pathogen Pantoes tavarti subspecies tavarti from a very closely related bacterium subspecies endologenes uh, who, which can also be present in the seeds. Uh, the validation of uh, these tests that I will present has been done within the valid test project. The study was uh, quite broader but today I will speak about two real-time PCRs as an example. The one uh, is based on the original publication by Tambong and is the reference test which most laboratories are using and the second one is re more recently published real-time PCR based on uh, PAL et al. Okay. So the process itself uh, is very well described uh, in uh, an EPPO uh, guideline uh, PM798 specific requirements for laboratories preparing uh, for accreditation. Uh, in the plant pest diagnostic activity and it follows a familiar sequence. So first we want to identify the test that we want to adopt, uh, define its intended use, uh, define adequate performance characteristics, review the validation or other data that is already available and finally review uh, possible altered conditions when performing a test with validation data available. And data from all this uh, goes into a risk analysis, which is a very strong and important concept in the new version of the ISO 17025 standard. So going step by step, uh, we said that we are dealing with uh, real-time PCR for Pantoes tavarti detection in maize seeds. Uh -huh. Uh, and the first thing is to define diagnostic parameters. You want to do this in advance uh, to uh, give more strength to objective decision making and you define the diagnostic parameters that are, are of uh, relevance to you and to your aims. So for example, if you are looking for um, a screening test, maybe sensitivity is more important to you than the specificity because you can first use the test, screen all the samples and then the ones that are positive, you can uh, test with another test. Whereas at least in the bacteriology field, when you are at the stage of identification of pure bacterial culture, sensitivity is no longer that important uh, and you can have a lower one but you would like to have a very good specificity, so accurate detection of the target itself. As we all know, the ideal test that would have 100% sensitivity and specificity very rarely, uh, if at all, exists. So in our case, uh, looking at Pantoes tavarti, this is a quarantine pathogen, and we are looking at the zero tolerance pathogen. So we want to detect it in really in traces. Uh, immediately that we detect it, there is some follow-up uh, uh, reactions that we need uh, to take. Uh, finally, we need to keep in mind that we are adopting and validating or verifying a test that in the end has to be appropriate, fit for purpose. And this is something that is really good to communicate with uh, risk managers and also with uh, other customers uh, as well so that uh, to ensure that uh, you are all on the same uh, page of understanding what is really needed. Okay, so uh, the next step is actually finding a test uh, and to do this uh, you can look in many different sources. You can look at legislation of course for some more important pathogens. Uh, this is what uh, is available. 
Uh, there are many international guidelines uh, which can contain very detailed uh, protocols. Uh, but the next step and quite important one is of course also literature search, searching for scientific publications, reports and also web search uh, for kids. Um, I would like to alert you to draw your attention to the existence of the EPO um, database on validation data, which also contains further information on previous validations done by other laboratories. Um, when you collect all this, um, you can end up with lots of data, but of course not all data is out there. So it's always worth to ask a colleague to ask those that have developed the tests, those that are using a test, or the producers of a certain kit, whether they have additional validation data if you have identified that uh, some of the data uh, is uh, missing. Uh, this process, I have to say, in our experience at least, is quite time consuming. Um, it can take a lot of time and often you end up with a lot of data that is not very comparable. So maybe they, they use a different uh, sample amount to uh, with which uh, they go into the procedure. Uh, maybe they use different machines, uh, all different variables uh, can exist. So going back to the process, to the risk analysis, the questions that you typically uh, ask yourselves uh, within risk analysis is first, to what extent is a test that I have found and gathered validation data for validated? Does it have the crucial diagnostic parameters uh, that I'm interested in? So if I'm looking for a sensitive test, does it have uh, details on analytical sensitivity? So the next question would be, do the diagnostic parameters correspond to my requirements? Is it sensitive enough for me? Is it specific enough for me? And uh, quite important things as well are how similar it is to my test. Do they use this test? Have they validated it for the same matrix? or they have validated for uh, fruit uh, tree leaves, and I'm looking for a test uh, to use in water or soil. Um, and finally, what you really want to think about is, what else will I modify? Um, and of course, um, this can be different things, can be tech technical things, but also bigger things like changing DNA extraction, ch changing uh, uh, real-time PCR master mix, what we will look at uh, later on. And this can depend on many factors. Of course, you want to have a test that is as good as possible, but we are all working within time and cost constraints. So if you have a high number of samples, you may choose a different uh, test or a different method. Uh, whereas if you are focusing more on high throughput with lots and lots of samples, you will go for uh, something else. So finally, all this is fed in to risk analysis, you process it, and you try to come to a conclusion on to what extent the validation data answers your questions and how close it is. And basically what you have to do, you have to decide whether in the end you will go for validation if there are not uh, relevant performance characteristics available, or you can go for a slightly lower extent of experimental testing for verifications if most or all relevant performance characteristics uh, are uh, already available. Uh, this risk analysis is, is therefore the most important step. Uh, you take really important decisions in that step and it is this part that is usually the point of discussions either with the auditor, either with your customer, whether the test really fulfills uh, their need and is uh, fit for purpose. Okay. So uh, uh, going back to the sources of validation data, uh, we would like to ask you which sources do you commonly check for validation data? And there are more answers possible. Uh, you can select several of them.
Okay, so most of the people have answered, so I will close the poll. Thank you. Uh, so we can see that it's more or less uh, as is usually in the guidelines. So some uh, international standards are, of course, recommended to be followed by the National Plant Protection Organization. EPO database on validation and scientific literatures are both equally important. Uh, companies are consulted uh, to a lesser extent, uh, possibly because uh, at least I can say for myself that sometimes I don't even uh, remember to ask a company to provide additional validation data. Uh, and since we have started doing that, we see that there's a lot more data there than uh, we would think. And of course, uh, word uh, is word of colleagues, uh, recommendations are all important as well. Thank you. So we can continue uh, and we will look at two examples of modifications. The first one is changing DNA extraction. Uh, this is quite common um, modification that many laboratories do. This is again an example from a test performance study organized within Valites for Pantoe Stavarti. And we have recommended the Quick Pick Plan DNA kit because this is the standard kit we use in our laboratory and was used during the in-house validation stage of all the different different tests that were later on included in the test performance studies. Um, however, we have left it open because we are aware that not everybody can use this kit. Uh, so we can see that uh, almost half of people then use the Easy Plant Mini Kit, which was also identified as a second choice uh, in our experience performing close to quick pick uh, plant DNA, DNA kit. But there were also other kits used. Uh, Okay, so uh, looking at the DNA extraction itself, we know that it's a critical step. However, it can only be assessed in combination with another test. And in this case, I will show it in combination with uh, Tambong. So based on the validation data that you collect, you can either decide to go for proper validation, determination of analytical sensitivity, as is shown here. And for this, the EPPO guidelines uh, recommend you preparing three standard curves, mixtures of bacterial suspensions uh, in plant extracts. And then with each of these mixture, you go to DNA extraction and further on to a molecular test to finally determine analytical sensitivity. Uh, of course, if you find in the literature or in other sources that additional data is already provided, you can go for a verification process, which is much less uh, extensive. So here is an example of a verification process. Uh, the recommendation here is to select uh, eight um, mixtures, eight spiked samples, let's say, uh, at concentrations that are of mo most interest. And in our case, that would be at low concentrations. So basically, we could just take this part, uh, prepare a mixture of bacteria close to the uh, theoretical um, analytical sensitivity, uh, isolate uh, DNA from this sample eight times and proceed uh, as before. So here uh, are the results in our case. So based on quick pick plant mini kit automated on Kingfisher and using Tambong. Uh, here in the bottom part, you can see the determined analytical sensitivity in plant material from uh, high concentrations towards lower concentrations in three different spiked matrices. This were two uh, maize uh, seeds um, for producing uh, corn and one sweet corn uh, seed. So we can see that uh, with all, in all three matrices, we are close to the limit of detection of real-time PCR, at least in our setting. So five times 10 to the three, uh, is always detected, in, indicated by this uh, green color. Lower concentrations can be detected on occasion, or it means that it's once out of three repetitions will be positive. So here are then uh, results from the test performance study, uh, including several other uh, DNA extraction 
tests uh, and shown is the achieved accuracy. So we can see that the highest was indeed with QuickPick by a Nobel, which is also automated. And the second one, uh, the Easy Plant Mini Kit, uh, has uh, a bit more variation. Some laboratories handle it really well and achieve the same level of accuracy as with QuickPick. And in some laboratories, hands maybe some improvements uh, should be made. Uh, here, it's only in the legend to this um, picture, but it's quite an important thing. It's a small disclaimer that the results shown here and the results of the test performance study uh, in whole uh, only reflect the specific study case and only the results on reagents at the time when they were included in the study. So it's really important to keep this in mind because if we were including samples with very high concentrations, maybe the results would be different, as, as well as if the producers would change something in their kit. So it's important to go beyond the numbers themselves when looking at the data. So the next common modification is changing master mix. This is the example of real-time PCR based on PAL. It's cyber green based real-time PCR. And what uh, we wanted to, to do what we had to do was go through the risk analysis and say, okay, what we will change and what do we want to achieve in the end? And we set ourselves two criteria for what uh, is an acceptable modification. And it's those that can still differentiate the two subspecies, Stavarti and Indologenes, and have the expe expected analytical sem sensitivity similar to other tests. And these are all the modifications that we have made. So we had to switch the uh, uh, master mix uh, because the one uh, that was recommended in the original publication was not available at the time to the um, community involved in test performance study. We switched the instrument, we changed amplification program and this is typically the first stage is uh, activation of polymerase and this you simply go uh, to the producer's manual uh, looking at what they recommend and change it to that. Uh, but we have also, one of the things we have changed, and I will talk more about this, is changing the annealing temperature. And this is probably the most critical change that we made. And to test this, whether this is okay, um, or actually to determine it, uh, we took DNA of Pantoe stavarti stavarti and separately endologenous, and we run a gradient PCR uh, with annealing temperatures from 60 to 68 degrees and determined the melting temperature. Um, and we checked the highest temperature where uh, stavarti was positive and in the one was negative. And in our case, with our modifications, this was 65 degrees that was then recommended also to the test performance study participants. So with this modification, we went back to the three standard curves that we had, and we tested them also with PAL. And what we wanted to see is similar analytical sensitivity as with our reference test tambong. And indeed, we can see that the analytical sensitivity, in fact, is uh, in this case even better. So as a final stage, you go to reporting and making conclusions on the test. This typically involves checking performance criteria that you have determined against initially set criteria writing of a report and some formal decision to adopt the test. And if you are working under accredited activity, this test will finally be discussed at an external audit. Um, so maybe just a, a request uh, from the community as well. Please submit the data to the EPO validation database, even if the modification is very small. It will be very helpful to everybody. So to conclude, I would just say a few words about reference materials. Uh, this, in this, in the sense of samples that we use in verification and validation, they can be of very different complexity. Here I have shown uh, mixtures of bacteria with plant extract, but when this is not available, or in some cases when you cannot grow the pathogen, synthetic uh, double-stranded DNA can be used as well. And this you can order just like you order primers, and you can use it in in the same way. Uh, another thing, currently we are probably at this stage. So we, each of us, we prepare our own reference materials. Uh, we use our own modifications of tests. And finally, we produce 
uh, uh, results of data validation. Of course, finally, in the end, using this approach, uh, it is sometimes questionable how comparable this uh, final results are. And one option that is very commonly used in some other fields is that uh, to shift to towards a more prescriptive approach. So, for example, saying you should all use the same method, same reagents, and then the results will be more com comparable, which would be indicated here. However, what we have seen throughout all the test performance studies and proficiency test, tests that we have organized um, uh, was in fact that all these different modifications, if you use them correctly, if you apply them correctly, uh, can produce good and accurate and valid results. So our preferred approach would be to have good reference material, common reference material, which you can then use to uh, confirm that your test uh, works well. Uh, there will be some more on this uh, at the webinar on March 10th. And with this, I would conclude my part and I would uh, invite the next speaker to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. So while preparing this webinar, we collected some examples of difficulties met by laboratories while adopting a new test. And we decided to present a couple of examples on Xylella fastidiosa. Um, if I can change of slide, yeah. So two years ago, uh, our competent authority asked us to evaluate the possibility of using ELISA um, to test for Xylella in order to reduce the cost of the official controls. And um, this ended up to be extremely difficult because we realized that um, the, the OD values of the positive and of the negative samples vary a lot from one host species to another. And this required us to, to acquire um, negative and positive reference material for all the different species we were planning to test. Another example, still on Xylella, but this time using PCR. In order to reach the best limit of detection, uh, we asked laboratories to use CTAB extraction, uh, and especially for oak and olive tree samples. And this was difficult for some laboratories. Of course, moving from an automated to a manual extraction uh, it requires different skills. Uh, it is more time consuming. And the use of chemical products uh, also raised some health and safety issues. We had many other examples uh, of difficulties uh, due to the training, the timing, the compliance with the deadlines, and so on. And since we could not present all the examples, we tried to categorize the different difficulties. And actually, we identified that many of them uh, are dealing with the project management. And the advice we can give is that before starting, you should save time to make sure that you have all you need. Uh, you have the appropriate protocol, you have the biological material you need, you have the appropriate equipment, and so on. Um, you also have to make sure that you can meet the deadlines that have been planned. Um, many of the difficulties of laboratory also come from the reference material. So, some material, of course, is commercially available from companies or biological resources centers. And most of us use our network to try to collect some new reference material. When it comes to the validation and the verification itself, um, you have to make sure that all the different steps are working together. It is not because you have uh, a validated sampling or DNA extraction procedure that this procedure will work with the, the new test you are trying to adopt. And when difficulties occur, it is very important to seek assistance from the supplier at, as it will help uh, a lot. As I said already, we have uh, seen many examples um, with some, well, some difficulties due to the training of the staff. And at the end, finally, when the, when the test has been adopted, it is important to have a regular quality control and to participate to proficiency tests in order to ensure the, the quality of the results over time. And 
this is all for my short part. Denise, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Yes, thank you. Um, so I will talk today about how to adopt a commercially available ELISA test or to re how to re-adopt the test in case if this test was a subject to a change or a modification. BioReba has like a double view on that aspect because we are a manufacturer and also we have a testing lab. So we have we are a certified manufacturer and have a testing lab with accreditation and have like a double view on the needs and challenges when a change or modification happens. Um, as a testing lab, um, you have to check if the performance characteristics provided by the kit producer are sufficient for your laboratory or your application. You have to identify potential gap. Um, you have to identify accreditation requirements modification requirements from your side and then there is a decision based on the, your risk analysis or the completeness of results that you can assemble if you have to do a verification in your laboratory if this is sufficient or if validation is needed and there is always the option to contact the producer. I would like to give you an example uh, when we changed our ELISA test for the detection of Citrus Tristezza virus. The reason for the change was that our existing stock of reagents depleted. This is not something that happens often. Usually we have for 10, 20 years stock of the same antibodies. So the source of antibodies will not regularly change, but sometimes they are out of stock and we have to produce new. When we do, uh, in that case, we did a new antibody production in the frame of a CRADA project and developed and validated these new antibodies in collaboration with a lab of Richard Lee at USDA. Our goal was to develop this ELISA for broad spectrum detection of Citrus Tristezza virus. We, as approach, we decided to raise antibodies against recombinant code protein. Publication is stated. Then, very importantly, we had to do a validation, and we did this validation of the new reagents in collaboration with the laboratory of Kereman Emanunat. Um, he's at the National Clonal Germplasm Repository for citrus and dates at UC Riverside. So they possess one of the biggest collections of CTV infected trees in the world. The challenge for us as manufacturer, first of all, we need to define our approach. We can raise antibodies against recombinant code proteins, but we can also use a classical approach where virus is purified from infected host plants and then used as immunogenic compound. We have to find a good partner for validation, and this is linked to the reference material or reference collection. Uh, we have furthermore to meet, or we try to do it, we, we try to meet the requirements of testing labs, and these are the worldwide basis. And this is quite a challenge since um, there are uh, local regulations in place. And then as a manufacturer, we also are happy and it's important for us to participate to test performance studies, but also to proficiency testing. Now the challenge for the testing laboratory and how to overcome it. The testing laboratory has to identify the gap first. If there has to check if there are additional requirements, modifications for the application or the accreditation. In a first step, we recommend to check the performance data provided by the kit producer. So for us, it's um, already a lot of information stated on our product information. It's about specificity and sampling, you get instructions, and also you have some publications cited in our product information. 
the change notification we also indicate it stated on our product information the version and date of this product and you have an indication about adaptation from last version so you basically need to have this information and then uh, the decision has to be done whether you can go for verification or if you need validation further challenges for testing laboratories are also to have access to reliable reference material and also the possibility to participate in TPS and or um, uh, test performance studies and um, proficiency testing, sorry. <laughs> and uh, we state some information on our product information, but there's always additional data available. So don't hesitate to contact us for additional results if there is a need. Thank you very much. Then I will give the word to Marta. No, Camilo. <laughs> Sorry, Camilo. <laughs> yes. So I will present you uh, some elements about uh, switching from uh, an internal molecular um, method to um, the use of a molecular kit. So if you are uh, an accredited lab and today you are using an internal molecular method, you need to have reference material, you need to select and have several suppliers to do the mix, for example, and then you have to monitor them and to do quality control on several reagents. So this is time consuming and a high staff effort. Uh, next. Regard if you use a commercial kit, so you have uh, one supplier, you will have easiest quality control because you will have m less uh, reagent to control and you will be guaranteed of lot to lot consistency uh, from the manufacturer. So this is time saving and low staff effort. Next. So regarding the laboratories, the laboratories, when they want to, um, they, when they want to switch to the use of a commercial kit, the first thing they need to do is to go to the manufacturer and ask for validation data. Then they have another process that they can use to get validation data, and this is from participation to TPS or PT with the use of the kit. Then one very important thing is to do verification or validation in order to um, include this, the use of this kit in the accreditation system and match the accreditation requirements. All these um, processes uh, present some constraints. So for example, uh, sometimes manufacturer validation data are not sufficient or are not available. Uh, the industrial secret sometimes is also a break to valid gener generating validation data, and reference and publication may not be available. On the other hand, TPS uh, and PT participation are, have a cost for laboratories, and they usually uh, not get always the information because it depends on the network you are working in. Uh, and then the national level is usually the level they are uh, organized. Finally, uh, on the accreditation requirements, as validation data may not be always available, there are some validation procedures to follow, and this is a, these have costs and they are quite long. And another point is that depending on the country, the national accreditation bodies can have different requirements, so you can not use the same validation data. In this presentation, I want to show you how, how the need of the and the constraint of the laboratories are the same and they are linked to the constraint of manufacturers. For example, as manufacturers, we have to produce validation data internally in the first time, and this is represent cost 
we need reference material availability, like laboratories. We need samples availability, and the industrial secret on some components could be a break one more time for the validation. Uh, manufacturer generates data also by participating with their kits uh, to ring tests, TPS, and PT. But also on this, we have some constraints on cost. On getting the information, this is very important because sometimes uh, we are not always in the same network, so that we don't get the information on all the PTP and PT and TPS organized. And these PT and TPS are currently mainly organized at the national level, and the manufacturers work at the international level. Finally, manufacturers uh, can um, generate dates on verification validation by using external laboratories, but this has some cost. So, in this slide, I will show you an example on a kit that we have developed in iPad Lab on uh, Flavescence Doré and Bois Noir. It's a triplex real time PCR. And I will show you how it can be long to pass through the development to the uh, final recognition by the market. So, the manufacturer validation has started in, 2000, in 2010, and uh, laboratories external uh, validation started together. Then in 2011, we start the commercialization. And two years after, some validation data came out and were generated from Earthrace Graph DP project TPS. That permits to the protocol, the method to be mentioned into the EM7 of EPPO Graph on Graph 1 in 2016. And finally, this year, some laboratory will be the first to use the this kit for accreditation on ISO 17025. This is only to show you how it can be long, all the procedure to start from the development of new kit and to finally the use of this kit in laboratories uh, ISO. And that's it. And I will pass the to Marta Santos. Thank you, Camilo. Uh, so today I'm going to show you one last example. Uh, and that goes uh, from going from morphological identification, quantification on nematodes to real-time PCR quantification. So uh, the question that, to, that I have to present today is one of our partners, HLB Laboratory, uh, located in the Netherlands, uh, wanted for, for, for us to collaborate with them to develop, a, uh, to change their traditional methods of morphological identification to uh, automated qPCR methods uh, for dictalinctus dipsisi. Um, no, just one second. Yeah, the um, the challenges here. I'm not going to extend myself uh, because they were all already mentioned. Uh, is as usually, the gather of the reference material. In this case, we had to have not only enough correctly identified reference material, but also enough quantified reference material. So you can imagine counting nematodes one by one to, to be able to, to do calibration lines. Then we had to assess the requirements imposed by the diagnostic of our partner. There's always, and this was mentioned before, what is biological relevant and what is practical and the time constraints and so on. Then we had to work on standardized molecular analysis. So there's always intrinsic variation in DNA extraction and PCR reactions. Of course, there's also always intrinsic variation on morphological identification. And um, yeah, even if you count the same sample twice under the microscope, you're probably going to get different results, right? So that also is the case in the, in the PCR reaction. And at the end, uh, we needed to generate the data to comply with the accreditation criteria. Here, and uh, the biggest challenge of them all, I would say that uh, two methods based on different principles will never generate the exact same result. Like I mentioned, um, we cannot expect counting twice uh, and get exactly the same result. Perhaps it's uh, not biological relevance, the difference, but it will not be exactly the same. And this is something that we need to understand in order to make sense of the data that we get and in order to assess if this answers our question yes or no.
So I'm going to um, present you the approach that we had together with uh, our partner in order to be able to go from the morphological to the, the PCR method. First, we did a comparison studies between the laboratories. What did they do and what do we do? Uh, or what do we have for, uh, for available for the, this uh, situation? Second, uh, we first identified that it was necessary to customize the DNA extraction methods that it was being used. So um, at Clear Detections, we have um, a DNA extraction method for nematode suspensions, but in order to fulfill the requirements of HLB laboratory, we had to adjust it. After that, we could, uh, he, we could introduce the use of uh, Clear Detections validated species specific primers. And what was the advantage of that? Here, ours were already uh, extended validated and with uh, information for that uh, available even in, on EPO database. So they can use this also for their, for their accreditation body. After that, we were finally ready to implement the Clear Detections calibration lines in uh, HLB laboratory. And then we were at the stage that the HLB laboratory could generate only the remaining verification and validation data that they needed uh, for uh, implementation of their method. And at the end, what we have is that we, as clear detections at this moment, supply the reagents with our quality insurers, and they have their uh, um, quality uh, control uh, required by ISO, but then it's kind of minimum. So this was a very organic process uh, between the collaboration between these two laboratories that managed to go from a completely morphological uh, quantification to a, a completely molecular. So this is, was the result at the end. We managed to have um, installed at our partner a molecular quantification method using clear detection kits. And it is fit for purpose and accredited and, in, and he, um, increased the capacity of the laboratory many times. Uh, so I would like to thank the, our partners, HLB, for their collaboration on this. And this was the example that I have very shortly. I have uh, a question now uh, for you. If you use um, kits, um, commercial kits, under your accredited activities in your laboratory. So about 80% of the people have answered and it's not moving um, much. So I will close the poll. Yes, so actually 64% of you use um, commercial kits on your accredited activity, which is, uh, well, <laughs> it's nice to hear. So, um, because I was the last speaker of this panel, um, I was left also with uh, presenting you the main conclusions to kick off the, the discussion afterwards. And um, yeah, for that, so um, together we, we found these as the main conclusions. The decision of adopting a new test is complex and it should reflect the best compromise between new requirements your time and resource cons uh, constraints, and it needs to always be verified or validated, depending on the, the data available. Um, that there will always be several challenges to the implementation, and we identify the main ones as the availability of reference material, the dispersion of information, and the different requirements imposed by accreditation bodies. Also, uh, the lack of availability of test performance studies and proficiency studies and information about them. But luckily, we also identified some um, improvements uh, moving forward. Yes. 
And um, on our opinion, but it will also be nice to, to hear your input afterwards, uh, the key points to facilitate the implementation of a new method we identified as being the collaboration between kit providers and laboratories, communication between stakeholders, that will be laboratories, kit producers, URL, NPPOs, EPO, in order to make a flow of information available, uh, use of reagents with quality insurance, and sharing the validation data with the community. So I would like to thank you for your attention, and maybe I give the floor back to Tanya. Uh, thank you very much uh, to everybody. Uh, this concludes our presentations uh, and now it's time uh, for questions. Uh, so if you have uh, questions, uh, you can either use the chat or you can also uh, ask, uh, raise your hand and we can give you the floor. So Maybe I can know uh, that uh, the... The webinar is recorded and, and that we will make the presentation and the recording available after the webinar. Uh, maybe I can answer uh, questions that uh, came up in the chat uh, after my presentation. Uh, the questions were about the dilution series uh, used to assess the two real-time PCRs. Um, the, question, the first question was, is DNA from the same dilution series used to compare the two assays? Uh, yes, uh, in this case that I have shown, this uh, were done on the same dilution series, so the analytical sensitivity of both Tambonk and PAL real-time PCR was determined on the same dilution series, both on the dilution series of isolated DNA and the DNA extracted uh, from spiked samples. And the question was further um, elaborated if uh, there were different dilutions prepared at different times. Uh, and um, with the comment that one should run the two assays at the same time, uh, usually. Uh, so again, in this case, it was done on the same material. Uh, it was not uh, done in parallel because uh, of at the time uh, when uh, everything was already prepared, basically for the test performance study, PAL uh, publication came out and we had to validate it really quickly, but it was done on the same material. So uh, in our approach, we think that uh, you have two possibilities, whether, for example, if you want to add a new test in five years time and compare it to, to the validation data that we have generated today, uh, one is to prepare a very um, reference material in a very standardized way and characterize it to the extent where you can be almost absolutely sure that it behaves in exactly the same uh, manner as uh, the material that we used now. Uh, for example, by additionally, additionally quantifying the uh, targets with digital PCR or alternatively include a, a small experiment comparing the a uh, new test that you may want to validate to more extent with the previous uh, test on a selection of samples. Uh, so that would be then verification against an older test. So there is a hand raised from Valérie Guimaud. So Valérie, you can uh, take the floor if you want to ask your question. I was just uh, curious to know the analytical sensitivity of the kit for the detection of Ditilenkus. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for your question. I do not know this by heart, but uh, I can I can for sure um, uh, send it to you. But I know um, that uh, you can detect one nematode on your sample. That is for sure. So the, the whole uh, processing of the sample and so on, you can even detect a fraction of a nematode, which is unrealistic, of course, but uh, at least one nematode. If there is one nematode, it will be picked up. I hope okay, this uh, answers. So I don't see any other questions. So uh, do not hesitate to raise your hand if you want to take the floor or to put your question in the chat. 
so maybe we have tried to identify the, the critical points and the, the most common modifications uh, that we are dealing with in, in our work. Uh, if we have missed some, uh, please uh, let us know. Or if you think that something else is uh, uh, very important as well. Uh, so there is a question uh, for Camilo. Um, why did it take 11 years to get a kit? Who didn't take 11 years to get a kit? The kit was developed in more or less one year thanks to the collaboration to one university, the University of Milan. Uh, then from the moment that as a manufacturer we did the valid internal validation to the final use in ISO 17025, it was so long, I think because we have to rethink and reorganize perhaps um, the different step and the different actor because as provider, it's always difficult, as I've shown in the in my presentation, to find a way to get validation data. Okay, so we had the change in 2013 to participate in GraphDepi with our protocol, but that was changed. Okay, and because we had the connection, uh, and then there is some times, normal times, to to have the mention in Apple, for example. But uh, then also the problem of accreditation bodies with different requirements at national level. So I think this is a problem that all manufacturer has, uh, in particular for quarantine disease like Favessons Ray, it's a quite hot topic. So I think the problem is, is not about the kit, like the question was, but it's more we have to find a way to make more, let's say, to improve the system to make manufacturer have validation of the kit and end user able to use validated kit. So there is a question from uh, Ruth uh, Barnon. So I will give you the floor. You can unmute yourself and then you can ask your question. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, I have a general question to, well, whomever wants to answer it from the panel. It's uh, on uh, validations itself in the past or in some other uh, bodies uh, do have the term trueness as a characteristic in their validation uh, methods or uh, plan of validation. Do you consider that trueness could also be replaced by verification or is this something completely different in your eyes? Maybe maybe uh, I can uh, start uh, to try to attempt uh, to answer this. Um, uh, I would say that um, what we are struggling with is really that the way we prepare materials at the moment, we have very, well, very little, we have limited comparability between different uh, labs. So I don't think um, that would enable us to address trueness in the correct sense. And on the other hand, we, for most pathogens, we have no idea what is the biological relevance of what we are detecting. So basically what we are trying to do, at least for the quarantine pathogens, is to go as low as possible. And uh, with different modifications, uh, yeah, to to achieve this, I'm not I'm not sure I, I I've answered your question. Uh, I would say that verification for now is sufficient. That would be my opinion. But please, if somebody from the audience as well uh, would like to, or uh, maybe you, uh, Root, who ask the question well i do agree with uh, the thing you're uh, you're saying uh well, well we uh, in our lab 
uh, are doing is transferring from ELISA to molecular testing. So we want to compare in our Trunus experiment that our molecular assay is at least as good as our current standard method. Uh, one could say that, well, that's actually what Trunus stands for. Uh, compare it with your current method and see if it behaves the same or better. And, uh, but yeah, one could also uh, uh, say that that is a verification. But I see the difference between a verification and Trunus as uh, if you want to compare uh, well, essays for you. For instance, if you uh, do uh, an essay like you uh, demonstrated, presented, uh, Tanya, then uh, it's more verifying if your new essay is behaving the same. And is that trueness or not? But uh, maybe it's mm -hmm. not worthwhile discussing, actually. But yeah, uh, my, my question is more like, should we still use the term trueness? Or should we just ad uh, adopt verification and uh, just get rid of trueness? That's actually what I was, uh, what is in my mind. Well, I have to say that in practice, in in our lab, so we also do GMO diagnostics, and their trueness is absolutely something that you want to want to um, use and uh, give uh, data on. Uh, but I have to say that in plant health, we do not really address it. And it might be something to do also with the lack of uh, very good or certified reference materials in the end, because you know if you want to determine trueness, and you do that in different labs uh, without providing a common reference material, how do you compare that? Uh, what you get and what is the real result in the end? Yeah, that's true. It's only used for internal, uh, yeah, internal processing. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. So we have uh, three more questions, uh, but there is one from Atika uh, Davud that is asking how many partners do you need in a TPS? So I think um, we can just say that there will be a, a webinar specific on uh, how to organize TPS and that you will have the answer there, but maybe Tanya, if you want to answer quickly. Um... <laughs> As far as I know, there there are no specific numbers. Uh, yeah. You know, just uh, yeah. So depending on uh, how much you already know on the tests you want to include in the TPS, or whether methodology is old or new, you may have to uh, look at uh, fewer or more TPS partners. What is probably so uh, in the TPS uh, studies that we have organized, we typically had around. 20 participants, 20 to 25 there, uh, doing all the different tests. But what I would say is more important uh, in TPS that you have participants that are familiar with the uh, methods that are used, even if the, some of the tests are new, so that you can be sure that the results you are getting really reflect the differences in the tests and not the different experience of the participants. And that's quite tricky uh, sometimes uh, and very difficult to differ differentiate when you get the final results. What is the matter of a test and what uh, participant? Um, so there is a question from Emily Foussard about new quarantine disease popping up. How long it will take to have a common test on accreditation? So, Emily gives the example of uh, veggie and uh, TOBRFV. So, tests are under development and have already been published for TOBRFV. At least there is an EPO diagnostic protocol. Uh, I don't know what we, what we can add. Uh, yeah, I think, I think this uh, question touches upon uh, something that we are probably all aware of that with the number of the different quarantine pathogens and the number of different tests, uh, it's a bit uh, uh, optimistic to expect that we will all have all the different tests uh, validated, uh, etc. at least in short time. Uh, so probably we will have to find a way how to do this with a bit different approach, not through such extensive uh, evaluation and validation of each specific uh, 
test that uh, somebody uh, is using. And uh, personally, I can speak for myself, I see a bit of a solution in uh, improving th this area of reference materials. Because if uh, the reference material is well prepared, it's challenging for you, and you prove that you can detect a certain pathogen on that reference material, then I am no longer interested in uh, all the different modifications and how you have checked it, for example. But I have no idea whether this view is uh, shared uh, or by how many laboratories is shared uh, and when we get to the level of accreditation bodies, that is even more obscure and there, there uh, are a lot of issues at the moment, I would say. Um, that are not clear. So there is a question from um, Matis Nas. How do you select the number of sample if I'm validating a test in which we will process uh, hundreds of thousands of samples a year? How many samples should the validation include? Uh, this is a very good question uh, that we are all struggling with. Again, there is no single answer. So the, the minimum requirements uh, in, for example, EPO guidelines, uh, they uh, require you to determine these diagnostic parameters on a certain number of spike samples, uh, etc. But of course, as a laboratory, you want to check uh, how the test uh, performs also on your uh, routine samples. I can uh, share our own approach. So we typically start with the EPO validation uh, scheme. Uh, we determine all the diagnostic parameters. Um, and if uh, a test and a pathogen is important for us, for example, like uh, Ralstonia in potatoes, uh, we would first uh, select, of course, past positive and the selection of negative samples, but that would be in the range of 20 to 50. But what we typically do after getting all this data, we already decide whether a test is suitable or not. And then we run um, this test in parallel to a previously used test for one or two seasons before we completely switch to the new test. But the number of samples would also depend, for example, in uh, uh, the example of potatoes uh, with Ralstonia. This is very standardized sample. It's potato tubers, always 200 tubers processed in the same way. If we are dealing with uh, other material uh, or when you are dealing with symptomatic samples, it gets tricky in a different kind of way because uh, it's much more difficult to um, repeat Reproduci reproducibly select the same amount of tissue with the same uh, extent of symptoms. You basically cannot do it. So you always have this expert judgment and you select the best material and the amount of material that you think is the best for the test in the case of symptomatic material. So we have passed the times of the webinar by 10 minutes. So for the questions that have been asked in the chat, uh, maybe we will try to make uh, a private answers by email, but I just would like to give the floor to two people that have raised their hand. So uh, first, Amandine Levant, so you can go ahead. Hi, thank you for this uh, webinar. I have a short question about the uh, specificity. Uh, maybe uh, Denise could uh, answer this question because uh, when we use um, ELISA kit for detection of viruses, uh, there is a, um, a data on uh, specificity for validation. And is it possible to use this data even if, uh, as Tanya said, it's uh, not uh, very comparable because sometimes you don't uh, use the same buffer or you don't use a, is, is there's few differences. So, is it usable or, or not? Or we have also to uh, uh, verify or validate again the specificity uh, using a correction of uh, isolates. Uh, Denise, we do not hear you. Denise, you, you have to, to unmute yourself. Unmute yeah. yourself, please. 
Oh, okay. You... <laughs> Not just... Yeah, Ooh, now you can, can go. Hear you. Uh, Tanya, stop uh, muting her. Mm -hmm. I will unmute her and then uh, she can speak. <laughs> nah. Yeah, Nadanis, you can unmute yourself and you should be able to speak. You you have to unmute yourself. Just to yeah, chat. you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Now? Good. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. The, the question was if you can use our um, specificity tests for your application, even if you do a change uh, like buffer, etc. So I would propose there to so the, the antibodies basically in a laser test are giving the specificity. So how they bind to the plate, um, what um, is accessible for the antigen, and then in the double sandwich we get the specificity. So if you don't change this, actually you should be able to rely on our, our results, but any change in buffer um, can have an influence on how the antibodies bind to a plate. Also, change in plate can have an influence on that. So we recommend to use our um, optimized test, and we cannot fully guarantee that you will detect everything by doing a modification. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, but if we made modification, maybe we should verify uh, the sensitivity, but you think that that can uh, have an impact on specificity? That mean, uh... yes, I, I think to a lower extent, specificity is affected than sensitivity, but I would recommend you to verify as well. And you can you. always do a first verification with the positive controls with supply if you have the same or equal detection already of that isolate, for example. But then we recommend to, to at least test the isolates that you think to be present in your uh, area. Thank you. Welcome. So uh, I think this is the end uh, of the webinar. So there is no other end raised. Uh, next webinar will be uh, next Tuesday and it will be on the use and validation of on-site tests. So if you are particularly interested on on-site tests, uh, you can uh, join this webinar. Um, the registration are still open. You can go on our website to register. So thank you very much uh, to the presenters of today and thank you all for your attention. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.